So I did grow up in Minnesota. I used to tell my parents that um, if they were really following God's will for their lives, we would not live here. <laughs> they always told me that I was crazy and that if I ever moved away that I would miss the seasons. And then I moved away and I discovered that was not in fact true. <laughs> but I am very happy to be back. Um, my husband and I both grew up in Prior Lake. You know, we've been back for a long time. Obviously, this is our home. It's part of who we are. Um, but we grew up in Prior Lake, and we had very similar yet distinct differences in how we appreciated the seasons growing up. And this is connected to my sermon. Don't worry, I'm going somewhere. But I grew up, you know, snowmobiling, ice skating, skiing, um, sledding, building snowmen, all those fun winter activities that children love. Um, and I was a part of our ski club, not ski team, I didn't do it competitively, but our ski club in my school. So we would, you know, be bused to Buck Hill one day a week um, to ski. And I realized one day after I had done this for years, so I don't remember exactly how old I was, but, you know, probably 15 or so. I realized as I was riding the chairlift up the hill and bracing myself from the cold that I actually hated skiing. <laughs> <laughs> that I would literally just try to get down the hill, make sure I didn't fall because that's snow and that's cold. And I would ski as many times as I felt like, you know, I should to really be engaging the experience. And then I would be done. And I was just trying to survive. Okay. <laughs> so after that, I quit. And I discovered things like reading books by fires. <laughs> <laughs> and things like that, right? My husband, he grew up also in Prior Lake. He would get a yearly pass to Buck Hill, and he was a snowboarder. And his experience was so dramatically different from mine because not only would he go every day, but he would go, and I'm not even making this up, when the governor would shut down the entire state, like all schools would be shut down because it was so cold that they were worried about kids having to be outside for bus stops. So they would close the entire states, all schools down, and Jamie would call me, and he would say, um, I'm going to Buck Hill. And I would say, but did you hear like that you could die <laughs> if you're outside and he'd be like, ah, I'd fine, you know, and he would, and he would go and he would snowboard all day. So dramatically different experiences. But then my family took me on vacation with them one year to Colorado. If you've ever skied, how many in here have ever gone skiing in Colorado? Like, I mean, no disrespect to Buck Hill at all. <laughs> Like, I really don't, but it is not the same. And I discovered that you could ski and not feel like you were gonna die from the elements. You know, that it was a beautiful, wonderful experience. Then Jamie and I moved to Germany. We lived there for three years, and Jamie discovered snowboarding in the Alps. And so every opportunity that he could, he and his buddies would go, and they would be snowboarding, and they'd be going down crazy backcountry. You know, they'd be having these adventures. And I kid you not, every single time when they would come home, there would be at least one story of how they almost died. It was glorious, <laughs> but I am glad that that part of our life is behind us. Now that we're here, we have eight kids, and some of them have followed in my footsteps, and we tend to stay inside and make gourmet hot chocolate <laughs> and, you know, maybe play games while the other kids go out. Jamie's taught most of them how to ski at Buck Hill. Our son, for several years, would get a pass um, from his grandparents for his Christmas and birthday to Buck, so he would be there skiing. One year, we gave him trick skis, um, and I said, you just can never tell me any stories about how these are used, because I don't want to have with my son the same experience that I had with his father. You know, the, oh, it was so great, I almost died. Like, my mom's heart just can't 
can't handle that. Um, but so then we did the same thing with Josiah that we had experienced ourselves. For his 16th birthday, Jamie drove him out to Big Sky, Montana to ski. And then this last year, our oldest daughter was 16. Josiah had turned 18. We had had other plans, actually, that had been changed because of COVID. Um, but it ended up working out for us to take the, it was the four of us, so we took the two of them out to Jackson, Wyoming. And Ellie and I got to walk around and experience the shops, the bakeries, you know, the beautiful mountain town, while Jamie and Josiah got to ski at Jackson Hole. And it has changed my son's experience with skiing, just like you know, Jamie and I have had our experiences changed. And this is actually what I want to talk to you about. Because when you taste of something different but better than what you know, how many of you know that it's difficult to go back? Right? After Josiah had been to Big Sky, he wasn't as interested in a pass to Buck Hill anymore. You know, it still has its place you know, for sure. But when you've tasted of something better, it's hard to go back. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, because life with the Lord is supposed to be an adventure. It is supposed to be skiing in the Alps. You are supposed to regularly have stories where you have no idea how God is going to come through. You just know that he's going to. And it's going to create an amazing testimony. And it's going to not just impact your life, but it's going to stir the faith of people around you. Because they're going to want to taste of the same thing that you have. You know, if you were to sit down with Jamie, and if you're a snowboarder, that is, and you were to sit down with Jamie and he was to show you the stories of the places that he has snowboarded and tell you about his adventures and the things he's experienced, there would probably be something in you that would go, I want to do that. I want to go there. This is what our lives are supposed to be doing for each other. We're supposed to be going on grand adventures and that those adventures don't just change us, but they actually change the world. I don't know if you know this, but when you became a Christian, that's what you signed up for. The problem is, is that sometimes we get bored. Do you know that God isn't boring? Religion is boring. Religion's really boring. You know, like religion actually robs life away from you. But God isn't boring, and so I'm going to suggest to you that if you're sitting here and you're trying to remember the last time that you went on an adventure with the Lord, that the problem isn't that he hasn't had an adventure for you. The problem is just that it's so easy to become disconnected from what he's doing. The good news is that it's just as easy to become connected again. And so that's what's going to happen today. Are you ready? All right. Well, if you're not, buckle up because we're going there anyway. So John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And I do want to say we're going to be reading a lot of scripture today. So please stay engaged because um, it's actually important. Mm -hmm. All right. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John... Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria near the parcel of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour. All right. Jesus was weary, and he was sitting next to a well. Now, it would make sense that Jesus was weary from his journey. You know, when we read in Scripture about a journey that Jesus and his disciples were on, they were not driving or flying places. They were walking, right? I love to go on road trips, and our children mostly love them. But, you know, when you're on a long journey, even when you're driving, you can grow weary. 
You want to be home. You want to be in the familiar. You miss something of comfort. You're tired of looking at cornfields. You know, whatever it is. Because, by the way, when you live in Minnesota, it's hard to not go by cornfields wherever it is that you're going, right? <laughs> but Jesus is weary, and it makes sense that he was weary because he's been walking on this journey. But that voice or that word there, wearied, it isn't just physically tired. That word actually means that it is weary because of labor united with trouble and toil. This is a weariness that goes beyond the physical. I think Jesus was emotionally spent. He was tired. You know, it's one thing if you are physically weary, because normally then you can take a nap you know, you can have a good night's sleep, take care of yourself a little, get some good food in you, whatever it is that you need to do, and then you get up and you're ready to re-engage. Physical weariness is actually pretty easy to handle. But what do you do when you're emotionally spent? What do you do when the weariness goes beyond your physical frame and it's in your heart and it's in your mind and you're weary? You know, this is the kind of weariness that robs us of joy. It steals away the adventure of life. And instead of thriving, we're just trying to survive. I think most of us have experienced this type of weariness, at least occasionally, especially in a season like the one that we've been in. Right? So Jesus is weary. Why is he weary? Well, we're going to talk about that, the backstory of this. And to start with, we're going to look in John 3, starting in verse 22. It says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John was also baptizing because there was so much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, just a hint for you, when you're reading scripture, when it says things like, therefore, after these things, pause for a moment and see what it's talking about. <laughs> it means that what you're reading is connected to something else. So after these things, what's it talking about? Well, the things that had been happening up until this point were that Jesus was having many people start to believe. People were being baptized. Scripture tells us that people were believing because of the miracles that were taking place. So this is an exciting time. Jesus is in ministry. He's got his disciples. John isn't in prison yet. He's been calling people unto repentance. They've been baptized. You can kind of get the sense that there's a rumbling going out among the people. A hope is rising. People are being baptized. They're seeing miracles firsthand. They're experiencing them. They're hearing of them. Things are going well. Jesus has cleansed the temple. Okay, they had their Passover, and I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but the temple had been set up as a place, a marketplace. People were supposed to be coming to worship Jesus, or not worship Jesus, worship the Father, and people were taking advantage of them and were trying to make money off of worship. They were standing in the way of people being able to come and perform this act of worship for the Lord. And Jesus, he is not having any of that, and he turns them out. And if you are someone who is not one of the money changers, this is good stuff, right? Because he is removing the people that have been oppressing, the people that have been in the way, the people have been taking advantage and so there is an excitement rising up. People are beginning to understand and guess that Jesus is the Messiah. They are thinking that this means that they are going to be saved, but not in the way that Jesus is going to save them. They're thinking in terms of political revolution. There is hope rising. Can you feel that? Do you see what that is? <laughs> this is the day. It's after these things. You know, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus right before this, and he shares the gospel with him. This is where we get, by the way, John 3, 16, that most famous of verses. You know, for God so 
that he <laughs> good you guys passed way to go right so that's the, what we use when we're sharing the gospel with people and it came from a real conversation that Jesus had with somebody ministry is going well good things are happening and yet yet Jesus is weary why is he weary well, in John 2, verses 24 and 25, it says this. Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Okay, what's he saying? Well, in the Passion Translation, it says it like this. Jesus did not yet entrust himself to them because he knew how fickle human hearts can be. He didn't need anyone to tell him about human nature, for he fully understood what man was capable of doing. Things are going well. There is hope. There's anticipation. But Jesus knows that they don't really understand, that they don't really see. He knows that there are people against him and that at one point, moment when the father says it's time that he's going to actually have to turn himself over to those people he knows what's coming he knows the salvation that he is bringing is different than what people are expecting he knows his road is not yet over and he is weary because not only does he see these things but he is walking with people every day who can't see it who don't understand Right? And so he is feeling weary. So back to where we started, John 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples, he left Judea and went away into Galilee. So he goes to Samaria. Why? Because he knows trouble is coming. He is on a journey, not just to get to some place, but he is leaving some place behind. <laughs> you know, there is a difference if you are trying to get some place, and so you're filled with hope about where you're going, and if you're leaving some place because you just can't be there anymore. <laughs> that type of journey is different. And that is the journey that Jesus was on. So he is on this journey and he is weary because trouble is coming because only he really understands and sees. And it's not just a physical weariness. So what happens next? John 4, verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father, father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And the woman said, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus says, You have correctly said you have no husband. I do feel like they could have condensed this account a little bit more, but anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, just a note for any of you authors in here. Okay. Um, <laughs> You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. And the woman said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, 
An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Can I just say how reassuring the disciples are to me? I love when I read and they don't know what's happening because it makes me feel better about myself. So, (laughs) all right. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields for they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered in. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. All right, yeah. So this is a lot. I told you we were gonna be reading a lot. Good job. This is a lot, so I just wanna focus on a few things from it. Jesus is weary, and he is sitting by this well, and so he asks for water. This makes sense. When you're weary and tired, you've had a long journey, you're sitting by a well, you are probably thirsty. But what does he get in return? He gets a theological debate from someone who is, you know, pretty hostile towards him. If you look at the things she says, you people say, You know, and there's good reason why she would be guarded and why she would be hostile. A Jewish man and a Samaritan woman would not have been friends in that culture in that day, right? But Jesus is weary. He wants a drink of water, and he ends up with a debate. Now, when you're tired and you're asking for water, is that what you're looking for? I had this experience, I'm sure you're all better people than me, but I had this experience recently where I was tired. It had been just a really busy time. We had had several days that were just packed with stuff. I was around people constantly having to engage, and I was just weary, and I needed to run out and get a few things. Like, I just had to run errands. You know, the kids got to eat, even when life is busy. I don't know why, but... (laughs) You know, right? So I'm out running errands, and I see somebody that I know. And so I'm tired, and I just want to go in. You know, this is one of those times when I'm so thankful for self-checkout, right? Like, you can just go in and not make eye contact and just, like, get the stuff you need and check out and go home, right? So I see somebody I know and I think, I'm not going that way. I don't need that that much anymore. And I go over here and guess what? A couple of minutes later, they see me and they come over and they go, oh, I'm so happy to see you. (laughs) Yes. 
what a lovely thing <laughs> that we would run into each other, right? And so I am tired and I am still kind of engaging. I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but I'm kind of still going about what I'm doing, but just trying to not be rude, you know? And all of a sudden I look at this person's face and she is tired. And I don't think it was a physical weariness. And she is talking to me, and she's asking me, you know, how I'm doing, and I'm just kind of making small talk with her. But as I start to actually pay attention to her answers, I see that there are some things that are not going very well for her. And all of a sudden, I realize that this moment is an invitation for me to put my weariness aside and engage with what the Lord is doing in this moment. This is the type of invitation that Jesus had in this moment. He's weary. He's engaging in a debate with this woman who's kind of hostile towards him. And he has an opportunity here. He could have just sat there and waited for the disciples to come back. But instead, he takes the invitation of heaven that's in front of him. Now, life with the Lord is supposed to be an adventure. But the adventures don't normally happen when we're rested and prepared and ready for them. You know, the Lord doesn't say, hey, pack your bags. Tomorrow at 4, I have a ticket for you, and you're going on an adventure. That's not what happens. Instead... He invites us on a journey with him to stay engaged with what is happening because at any moment, heaven can invade earth and we have the opportunity to engage with it. And that's what was happening with Jesus here. And when I was reading this this week, I just have to tell you that I'm speaking out of what the Lord's been speaking to me. But when I was preparing my message, and Jamie asked me afterwards, you know, how did it go? I was like, oh, it was so convicting. Because this is what the Lord is speaking to me about. Because what I have realized is that recently I have been weary, and in my weariness I have stopped engaging with heaven. I have stopped engaging. You know, we had... Michael and Meredith Malden here last weekend, which was awesome. Yes, you can cheer for them. It, it was amazing. I had never met them before. You know, it was a newer relationship for Jamie. He got connected to Michael um, through a friend that just said, you guys need to know each other. Um, and on Saturday, while Meredith was here working with our worship leaders. Michael and the kids spent some of that day at our house with our family. And so Jamie and I were just sitting, talking with him as the kids are playing. You know, I'm just getting to know him a little bit. And I'm hearing, you know, his testimony, how he came to the Lord, what the Lord's been doing in their lives, some of the adventures they've had with God. And there's this thing in my heart that is stirred. And I'm thinking, when's the last time that I was sharing stories like that. Why is it that when I'm sitting here trying to remember what the Lord has done, that I'm having a hard time? Not because he's not doing stuff. He hasn't stopped working. I stopped celebrating it somewhere. I grew out weary and I stopped celebrating and I became disconnected. And the Lord is waking me up. Yes, yes, you should clap for that. He is waking me up. And he's saying, you're supposed to be having these adventures. They're not supposed to be past tense. They're supposed to be right now. You know that encounter that you had with that person in the store? Like, that's a testimony. Like, that's not just a chance thing. Like, stop being so self-focused that you're not recognizing those moments of heaven and celebrating them. You know, God wants us to be on an adventure. That's what life with him is supposed to be like. You know, this story with Jesus and this woman, it's a scandalous story. Here we have a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman. Here we have this rabbi talking to this woman that people would not have accepted 
This wasn't something where, you know, the Pharisees walking by would not have gone, oh, look, how nice. Jesus is having a nice conversation with that lady. You know, this is a scandalous story. This is a woman with a past, and it's not in the past, but it's in her present, right? (laughs) This was not normal or proper etiquette. Yet, Jesus sees the invitation of heaven in a moment. He engages with it. And what's the result? Salvation comes not just to this woman, but to this town. Jesus is weary. He's sitting by a well, and he has a conversation that leads to revival. When's the last time that you had a conversation by your water cooler at work that led to revival? That's the invitation that we all have because that's what life with Jesus is. Now, there's something else I want you to note, and it's the experience that the disciples were having and Jesus was having were not the same. They were having the same actual experience, but they were (laughs) experiencing it very differently, right? I love that when the disciples come back, you know, it says they're amazed that Jesus was talking to this woman, but they don't ask him. You know why, I think? The same reason we don't stop to ponder the verses in scripture that don't make sense. Because it's not comfortable. It's not safe. It's just beyond what we are feeling ready to handle. You know, the disciples, they would have been excited. They were with Jesus. All these good things were happening. But they would have been weary too. They've been on quite the journey. They've been physically on a journey. But also, you know, they left their homes and families to be with Jesus. You know, they've been on this journey, too, and so I think they see Jesus talking to this woman, and they're like, oh, please don't ask him. Like, I, I, I can't take one more thing, because, you know, Jesus has been kicking over their sacred cows. It would be a lot to be with Jesus. Like, sometimes I think, I wish that I could have lived in the days of Jesus. I could hear him. Like, if he was right here physically, and he could talk to me, that would be so awesome, You know, because often I'm like doing my best to try to figure out what he's saying. Lord, I'm trying to follow you. Am I hearing you correctly? You know, like there's so much mystery about walking with Jesus. And sometimes I think if he was just here. But then I read this and I go, well, the disciples were with him all the time and they still didn't know what the heck was going on. (laughs) Right? So why do I think I would be any different? You know, this is what life with Jesus is. Because it's not anything that can be contained in our own understanding. So (laughs) Jesus is talking to this woman. The disciples don't ask about it. And then (laughs) they're, you know, they're trying to care for him. Like, it's actually beautiful. They went to go get him food, you know, and they come back. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but where you've, like, made a meal and your kids snacked. Like, why would they do that? Do they not know? Like, I'm right here cooking, and you're, like, over there eating chips? Like, do you not know? Like, why are you not hungry for my food, right? So they're out getting him food, and then Jesus starts talking about the food that he has, and they're like, did somebody give him food? Like, (laughs) what's going on here? Why did we go if somebody else was going to give him food, right? But (laughs) they don't understand. They're missing the moment, That's because they're eating the wrong food. You know, we have this tradition in our home. Jamie and I started it without really realizing what we were doing. We just kind of stumbled into it. So years ago, when all the kids were younger, you know, we stay at home with our kids on New Year's Eve, and we'll, like, pray and do communion around midnight. But before that, we'll play games and watch movies and just kind of celebrate together. And Jamie had this idea one year of getting crab legs and that we would have this special, you know, meal, which was awesome because really at that time it was he and I eating crab legs because the kids were too small, really. They didn't, they didn't like seafood. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. And we just kind of did it the one time, but then we, it just became this tradition. And the thing that we did not foresee or understand was that as we were encouraging the kids to try crab, 
that some of them would begin to love it. And how many of you know that buying crab for two people is a lot different than buying crab for 10 people? <laughs> so a word of advice, parents in here, you know, maybe just think this through before you start your own family tradition. Like maybe you eat hamburger helper on New Year's Eve. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but we have, we have one daughter in particular that in the first service I didn't name, but I'll just say she's over there somewhere. She dances. Um, <laughs> who loves crab. She has very good taste. And that's a beautiful thing, but you know, here's the deal, is that once you've had crab legs on New Year's Eve, you're not going to be okay with going to Hamburger Helper. Right? Because you've tasted of something better. And that's what life with Jesus is, is you're supposed to be eating the crab. <laughs> yes. You're supposed to be eating the crab. If that's not your speed, filet mignon, whatever it is, you know, that's your, your thing. Jesus is eating food that the disciples aren't there yet. They haven't tasted of it yet. You know, in Jesus' goodness, he doesn't let them miss the moment, though. Like, he says, hey, I've been eating food that you know nothing about. And then he begins to tell them, you know, he says this, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they're white for harvest. The disciples just went to go get food. And they come back, and Jesus is inviting them into actually experiencing, engaging with heaven. He's trying to show them, you're concerned about these things, and there may be a time and place for those things, but those aren't the things that your heart is actually supposed to be towards. You're not supposed to be living for the earthly realm. But if you would just look up your eyes, if you would just see the harvest is all around you and it is just waiting for you to engage it. The harvest is not any less ready in our day than it was in Jesus's. You know, the kingdom is advancing. It is always advancing. The reason that you may not be seeing it is probably because of what you're feeding yourself. And I say that being convicted myself because this is how the kingdom of heaven works. It's planted like a seed and it grows. It's like leaven. It expands. It comes in a smaller form and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, do you think that the kingdom just somehow today stopped working? He put things in motion that had really been in motion before then, but those things have been continuing to grow and expand. And so here we are 2,000 years later, and if the kingdom isn't bigger... If our eyes aren't seeing it, the problem isn't the kingdom. It, it, the enemy didn't overcome the work that Jesus did. It has been advancing. It is growing. And so the problem, if we're not seeing it and experiencing it, is because we're just not looking correctly. The good news, though, <laughs> is that today we have the invitation to lift up our eyes. Because life with God is supposed to be an adventure. You know, I love adventure. I'm a seven on the Enneagram, if that means anything to you. <laughs> I like trying new things. I love traveling. You know, growing up, I didn't really see myself getting married until possibly I was in my 40s. I wasn't going to have kids. My life's turned out slightly differently than that. But part of that, I think, was just because I envisioned life where I was on the move, where I was going, I was doing stuff. You know, I was traveling. I had, like, an exciting life. I still have an exciting life, and it's far better, by the way, than the one that I had dreamed of. So I'm certainly not complaining. I am very thankful. Yes. But I still will find myself caught up in dreaming of the next adventure. You know, our family goes on a lot of road trips. We went on one that was 33 days long once. And at the end of it, we're home. And, you know, we have some people basically just like kissing the driveway. 
we're home. <laughs> you know, I get to sleep in my own bed. Like there's just, you know, there's good things about being home. And I'm like, where are we going to go next? You know, it's just how I work. It's how I'm wired. I love being home, but I love adventure. And I found that in this last season, I began dreaming more and more about adventures other places. You know, the trips I wanted to go on with my family, trying to figure out how we could make these things work. I was becoming less engaged with life here as I was daydreaming about the adventures out there. Now, some of that is because of how I'm wired. Some of that is because my kids are growing older, and so I'm feeling that, like, oh, it's now or never. <laughs> you know, life is changing. Those things are natural. But I want to tell you that a lot of it was actually because I was weary, and in my weariness, I stopped engaging with what the Lord was doing here, and I began trying to satisfy myself with earthly food instead of heavenly food. I'm just being transparent with you. The Lord has been waking me up, and he's telling me, like, the harvest is around you. Stop dreaming of out there. You know, it isn't that my family can't have adventures together, but I am planted here, and I can't be trying to satisfy my need for adventure by dreaming of some place that requires no responsibility from me. <laughs> The Lord is asking me, even in my weariness, to lift up my eyes and see the harvest and engage. And I have been repenting. I've been doing a lot of repenting recently about this. Because the problem is that in my tiredness, I've become distracted and I've been living off the wrong kind of food. The good news is that the Lord is waking me up and he's reminding me to lift up my eyes and to begin living for a greater purpose. Yeah. In verse 34 there in the message translation, it says it like this. Jesus said, the food that keeps me going is that I do the will of the one who sent me, finishing the work that he started. You know, this is the thing that is supposed to compel us. It's the thing that's supposed to get us up in the morning and keep us going, is that we see what the Lord's been doing, and we know that we're supposed to be engaging with it. We know that it's not done. You know, if you have people in your family that aren't saved, the Lord's not done with your family yet. If you have promises in your life that have not been fulfilled, it's because the story is just not over. So don't become disengaged. This isn't the moment to get weary or to shrink back, but this is the moment every day where you wake up and you stir your faith and you go, this isn't done yet. God promised this to me and it's not done yet. And so this is what my eyes are on. You know, Michael was here last week, and he was praying about or preaching about courage. And I'm going to just be honest, because I've <laughs> confessed so much to you already, <laughs> that I really liked his sermon, but I wasn't fully engaged with it, because I was thinking, well, I don't, like, I'm going, is there an area where I need courage? Like, I feel like I have, okay, courage. Like, Lord, if you tell me to do something. You know, this is what happens when you're deluded, by the way, when your senses are dull, right? And, you know, and so I'm, you know, I'm listening to the sermon. It's great. It's wonderful. And then at the end of it, all of a sudden, the Lord's presence just falls on me like a brick. And it's because he was saying to me, you know, as he is so often lately, wake up. And he was showing me the things in my life that I had lost hope for. The things that I was praying for, but they were just token prayers. Because I didn't actually have faith. I wasn't actually engaging heaven with them. I was just trying to do the thing I was supposed to do. You know, I have someone close to me who is in need of healing. And I've been praying for this person. And I've been praying for them at least once a day. But do you know that I was praying the entire time not actually believing that they would be healed? 
Like, I'm just being honest. I was praying the whole time, not really actively engaging heaven, just trying to do the thing I was supposed to do, not thinking that my prayers were actually going to matter. I was the problem. It isn't the Lord. You don't actually get to go on adventures with God without faith. And in that moment when his presence came on me, he said, you, you're not actually praying if you don't have hope. You're not actually praying if you're not engaged with me. Look up your eyes. What do you see? Like he said this to me in the service, not even in relationship to the harvest, but look up your eyes. What do you see? And do you know that when you see Jesus, when you see the Lord, that the way you look at everything changes, that it's impossible to look at him and not engage the world differently? Because all of a sudden I'm going, oh, Lord, forgive me. I need courage to have faith. I need courage to look at you and then look at the world around me because if I look at you first, then I know that I'm supposed to be part of the solution. I'm supposed to have faith when I pray for people that they're going to be healed. I'm supposed to be willing to endure the theological debate maybe even the political discussion with somebody because they need to encounter heaven and I'm the vessel that they're going to encounter heaven through. <laughs> I was made for adventure and it's not just road trips with my family, but it's the adventure of seeing people saved and healed and set free because I'm engaging with heaven and pursuing seeing his kingdom established in the world around me. I'm supposed to be healed <laughs> and delivered and set free. That is the adventure. In Matthew 11, and I am closing, it says this in verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's this divine exchange that happens when you engage with heaven, when you engage with Jesus. You get to give him your burdens. You get to give him all of the weariness that you have. And in its place, you get his yoke. Now, here's the thing, though, and this is the important thing, <laughs> and then I'll bless you and you can go on to lunch. <laughs> but when you are giving Jesus your burdens and your weariness, and he is giving you rest, he is giving you rest for your soul, your peace, you have peace, your heart is at rest, your mind is at rest, your emotions are at rest. He's not meaning that he's giving you rest and like now just lay back and don't do anything. It's that when you go about the work that he has for you, because he has work for you, as you go about your day, as you're in the grocery store and you're weary, as you're sitting down and you just want something to drink and somebody is trying to engage with you in a heated conversation, you know, like, by the way, you don't have to engage in the politics of it. Get higher. That's what Jesus did. People would come and they would talk to him about things, and he wouldn't engage in the muck and mire. He's not here for earthly things. He's here for spiritual things. So when people come to you, when you come across people in your path, that's your invitation to set your weariness inside and engage with what heaven is doing. Because as you do, you're going to find grand adventures in the kingdom that any time you encounter someone, that it could very possibly not just lead to their salvation, but actually to revival. You should be way more excited about this. I mean, seriously, think of this. You could have a conversation with somebody that could change not just their eternity, but the eternity of their family and all of the people that they have influence over. You could have an encounter with somebody while you're feeling weary, 
Well, you're not even looking for it. And it could bring about the very revival that your heart has been crying out for. Adventure is out there. It's our responsibility to engage. So I'm going to just ask you two questions, and then I'm going to pray for you. But when is the last time you went on an adventure with Jesus? One that resulted in his kingdom being advanced in the earth. Because if you can't remember, today's a good day to change that. And the last thing is just what are you feeding on? What are you feeding on? Are you feeding on your connection with the Lord? Are you remembering all that he has done? Are you feeding on his words, on his promises? Because what you feed on is going to determine what happens in your life. All right, if you could please stand. I'm going to pray for you because life with Jesus is supposed to be an adventure. And it's supposed to be more like the Alps than Buck Hill. <laughs> you're supposed to wonder how you're going to come through. Because you're not supposed to be on an adventure that's of your own making. It's supposed to be a divine, heavenly one. And those adventures are impossible. The Lord will bring you into impossible situations. He'll ask you to do things that are impossible. And then he'll come through. So I want you to just close your eyes. And I'm just going to bless you. I'm just going to pray over you. So, Father, I just thank you for each person in here. I thank you that you've given them all a testimony. Lord, that you have done things in their lives. And I ask, Father, that you would begin to bring remembrance to their hearts of all that you have done how you've saved them, healed them, set them free. Lord, I want you to bring to remembrance the things that they never even noticed or realized were you in the first place. But it was your divine hand guiding and protecting and providing for them. Lord, I ask that you would bring to mind promises that you have spoken over them. And that as they come to mind, that they would have the courage to hold on to them with a fresh hope today. Father, I ask that each person in here would encounter your presence in a fresh and new way. That they would encounter you and remember what it's like to be in that divine connection with you. How much joy and life and peace and hope there is. How much it changes things. Lord, that as they taste heaven, that they wouldn't be satisfied with earth. So, Lord, I thank you. I thank you because from this congregation, there are going to be countless salvations. There will be revival that will flow. There will be reformation that will come. Lord, I pray that you will bring unlikely people into their path. And as they engage with them, that those people in turn would be able to bring revival and salvation into the lives of those they know. Father, I pray that people in our congregation would be the reason for revival in lands far off. And they wouldn't even know it until heaven. But it's just because their life is a divine adventure with you you and that they wouldn't be satisfied with anything less so father just bring hope alive in hearts today bring excitement anticipation bless people today lord i pray even today as they go to the grocery store on their way home to a restaurant that their eyes would be up that they'd be looking at the harvest that they'd be looking for their next adventure that they would be encountering you every place that they go so just thank you father and just pray this all in jesus name amen thank you if you are wanting prayer, there will be people up here to pray for you. Otherwise, pray for one another and go out and have an amazing week. And when you get your testimonies, send them to me because I want to hear them and celebrate.